Okay, so let's recap the correct answers for the CP questions. First question, five differences. It's all given to you in a spreadsheet. I mean, you can't even, you're not being able to, nobody, nobody was able to answer on all the points properly, okay? And the answering is also quite sloppy because many of you said high transparency, but high transparency with respect to what? Okay, the, the point itself mentions uh, with respect to, if you just say high transparency, that is not sufficiently specific, especially when information has been given to you about exactly what that transparency deals with. Okay, so that nobody mentioned that transparency with respect to market information. Then listing of securities, no one mentioned. Located, location in a fixed place, okay, this part you got, most of you got right. Then uh, this point, hardly anyone mentioned properly, very few, some of you just touched upon it. But this is one of the most important, four and five were actually the most important distinctions. And four was hardly mentioned by anyone, okay. So very, very poor performance. These are some basics. I see you guys running around here and there, uh, talking in the class and doing all these kind of things. These are all basic concepts in finance which you are not able to internalize even though it has been taught to you so many times. I mean, it has been taught to you, discussed in the class in detail and uh, you are still not able to answer it properly. So make sure you go and revise all these matter, all these questions. So these are all very basic concepts which you should have been able to ace. Uh, everyone should have got 12 out of 12 in this, on this question. Okay. The other two I did, I, I understand a little more, more difficult. But the first question, everyone should have got 12 out of 12. A uh, question point number five. Okay, so this this point basically is that in in the case of ETM, uh, your counterparty credit risk is managed by the exchange clearinghouse. And this the point that you should mention is that they are engaging the the ECH engages in credit risk intermediation. Okay, that is the proper way to distinguish. Whereas in the case of OTC markets, there is no credit risk intermediary. It is completely on the two parties involved. So this is the part that should have been, this is how this question point should have been explained. Uh, then number five, standardization. Many of you mentioned standardization except for one team. Uh, no one mentioned standardization of what? Again, standardization of lunch, dinner, breakfast, what? You know, standardization. Just people just mention standardization. Again, this shows that you're not, you don't have an eye for detail. When you're studying something, you're not, you're not studying it in detail, you're not trying to understand it. Only one team mentioned that the contract terms are, Contracts are there, there also, you didn't say contract terms, you said contracts are standardized, that's fine, okay, that is reasonably close. Most of you didn't answer this properly, okay. So standardization itself doesn't mean, uh, okay, so this part you got right, that futures and forwards, that part some of you got right, okay. Uh, so, okay, so this is fine, this, this is as far as this question is concerned. Any other questions on, on this first question? Anybody has any questions? On the first question, okay. So that's one. Then second, CME, CME clear port, what happened? How is CMO? Uh, this also was not properly answered. I think Pranav gave the best answer on this point, but even his answer was not sufficiently, uh, on an absolute level, his answer was also not sufficiently, uh, it's not adequate. Oh, I had to close that file. So if you remember the, uh, I'll just explain. You can look at the notes. Uh, you can look at the notes later on. Okay, but I'll just explain what uh, we have in the case of CME Clearport, and that is. Uh, so the point that you have to say, the way, the correct way to answer this question is, obviously you have to refer to which distinction. Okay, if in what way is CME? Many of you actually didn't even refer to CME Clearport. You just kind of just talked about the distinctions. Okay, so that is not the way to answer this. You have to read the question properly. And then CME Clearport, what is, so you have to talk about, uh, what is the distinction? There are five points of distinction that we have discussed. On which point is CME Clearport blurring the distinction? Or maybe more than one point, but you have to be specific on those points, all right? So you have to say first that CME Clearport is actually blurring the distinctions on point number four. On point number four, which we had mentioned and said that if there is credit risk intermediation in, in ETM, but it does not exist in the by the ECH, but that does not exist in OTC markets. But what is happening in the case of CME Clearport is, because of the concerns of market counterparties uh, on their own, they've come up with these ideas that uh, they would like to do the transaction in the OTC markets between themselves, okay? Not an, uh, not an exchange market, uh, not an exchange traded transaction, the transaction is an OTC transaction. 
So you do that on the OTC market, but then you pass it to CME clearing. You pass it to the CME clear board, so then it gets cleared just like an exchange traded transaction. That is the point that should have been brought out. Okay, so there are many elements to this. Okay, that's why there are six marks. And then it gets cleared, so therefore what is happening is even though it was actually an OTC transaction to start with, it ends up being a transaction which features uh, credit risk intermediation by the exchange clearing house. Are you guys following what I'm saying? Okay, so uh, so that's basically the way to answer this question to say that okay, and because this is happening, you are actually ending up blurring the distinction with respect to point number four because you can no longer say that in those OTC transactions which are going through CME Clearport, you can no longer say that the ECH is not functioning as a credit risk intermediary, okay, which you see on the right hand side of that spreadsheet on point number four. That statement can no longer be made. That's why it's make blurring the distinctions. So this is how it should have been answered, but not well answered. Bilateral collateralization, again, you should mention that this is a, many of you discussed this as if this is some kind of, it's like nobody got this right, okay? So many of you mentioned this as if this is some kind of exchange traded market ETM uh, phenomenon. That's not the case. Bilateral collateralization is an OTC market phenomenon, okay? So this is where two OTC market counterparties, they collateralize their transactions. So they try to behave with each other with respect to the valuation and the collateralization of the transaction. Like an exchange clearing house, they try to basically do regular or daily mark to market of the transaction. After doing the transaction, they will they'll have an agreement in place between themselves for collateralization and they will uh, basically array, uh, engage in either daily or weekly, or some kind of regular uh, mark to market of the transaction and then whoever is losing money will have to post collateral, further collateral with the, uh, with the um, other party, okay, the person, the party who is winning on the contract. So this is essentially trying to mimic what the ECH does in an ETM setting, okay. What the ECH does is it tries to protect its credit risk exposure to each of the parties by requiring every losing party to put up uh, cash equal to its losses, also to put up initial margin, okay. So by margining, essentially margining and making margin calls, the ECH tries to protect its own credit risk exposure to each of the parties. In bilateral collateralization, each of the parties in the OTC market setting without the ECH in between, they try to behave with each other in the same way. So one party, say if Citibank Hong Kong is dealing with uh, Deutsche London, and they have a collateralization, uh, collateralization agreement, then whichever they'll monitor the transaction after it is done, and whichever party is losing money, let's say after a one week period, they will have to post additional collateral to make up for the losses, to secure the losses, uh, to secure the credit risk of the other party with respect to the losses. Are you guys following what is being said? Yes, sir. Okay. Okay, so this is how bi bilateral collateralization this an answer should have been given. Okay, again, very, very disappointing performance because you have got, these are all basic things in finance. Okay, everyone should have been like, be able to answer this like two plus two is four. But very, very poor performance that I'm watching. And then we are already kind of more than halfway through the course, I think. Okay, so we will continue with our <coughs> with the, oh, this is IPM. Have you guys started practicing with your Rwanda software? Yes. Or some, everybody has not started practicing. So you better start practicing because we'll start your project. I'll give you the date when you start your project. I'll look at it. But I think you have about at least a week you still have. But get used to what you have to, is everyone clear about what needs to be done? Because the project related information we have already shared with you, I've already discussed that with you. Exactly what you need to know to do your project, okay? So if you have any doubts, you can ask in the class. 
or come to me but ideally you should first check and also the point of giving you all the video now is that it's, uh, the content is richer it's better than just audio so you should try to listen to the video and uh, understand your, I'm not going to give you a different explanation if you come to me I'm not going to give you a different explanation from what I've given you in the class so the information is already there try to listen to the video and understand it again and that will also help your own understanding rather than coming to me and expecting to be spoon fed okay if you finally even after that if you don't understand you can always come but uh, you should try and do it through the video first it will also help your understanding Okay, I think yesterday we were at basis risk. Okay. <coughs> All right, we were at ba we had just started discussing basis risk. Okay, so we go back to the example of the airline, which has the jet fuel exposure. Okay, so what is the underlying position of an airline with respect to jet the jet fuel market? Long or short? Some are long. From the on the left hand side, I see some people saying long. Who is saying long? Mitchell, or you are giddy saying long. Underlying, so let me repeat the question. Underlying exposure of an airline with respect to the jet fuel market. Short, short, short. Yes. short. What is giddy saying now? No idea. No idea. Okay, okay. Short. So, is everyone is saying short or everyone is saying long? Short. 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 Okay. So, the underlying exposure is short because they will lose money if jet fuel prices go up. Okay. So, that's why the underlying exposure is so short. So again, this brings out the distinction while we are discussing basis risk. We also have to go back to the distinction between outright positions and spread positions. Okay. So the underlying exposure that exists in an airline with respect to the jet fuel price, that is a short position. Okay, and that's also an outright short position, as opposed to be a as opposed to a short position in a spread or a short spread position. Are you understand? Are you following what I'm saying? We have already made a distinction earlier about between outright positions and spread positions. Yes, sir. Okay. While discussing that, actually, we came to basis risk first. Okay. So we made the distinction between the outright position and the spread position. So in understanding basis risk, you have to bring in those ideas as well. Okay. So outright position, the natural exposure of an airline to the short jet fuel market, that's a short. That's an outright short position in the jet fuel market. Okay, so then we also discuss the question of what should the uh, airline do if it's a, if it's behaving properly like a hedger, if it is actually behaving in the way that a hedger should behave. Okay, and what does a hedger try to do? Reduce risk or increase risk? Reduce risk. Reduce risk. Okay. Yeah. So we looked at this uh, question of uh, we looked at two two options that the airline has. One is to do nothing about its outright uh, jet fuel exposure, and then the other option that was given to the airline is to hedge that short jet fuel position with a long uh, position in crude oil futures okay so uh, you have a short outright position in jet fuel and you hedge that by taking a long outright position in or an outright long position in crude oil futures okay so this is why so the, obviously because the underlying exposure is short okay therefore the hedge position has to be long because remember what is the word we use offset so the hedge position has to be the opposite of the underlying position. So the moment you know that the underlying position is short, okay, then immediately you know that you, when you want to hedge, your hedge position should end up being long because it has to offset the short position. Mm. This is clear. And then again, bring in the connected idea of hedge transaction versus hedge position. So if your hedge position has to end up being short, then uh, sorry, if your hedge position has to end up being long. Then the hedge transaction has to has to be a purchase, a buy or a purchase. Okay, this is clear. How we are using the words very particularly that we are making a distinction between a hedge transaction, which is to buy or to purchase, and a hedge position, which is a long or a short. Okay, this is clear. You following? So we have in the discussion of basis risk, we are bringing in two additional uh, concepts. One is outright position versus spread position, and also the concept of hedge transaction versus hedge position. 
And then also we're bringing in the idea that, once again, we're recapping the idea that a hedge position has to offset the underlying position, okay? That's why when the underlying position is short, the hedge position has to be long, okay? So, now we looked at the other decision problem of the airline that they have, that whether they, they have a choice, they can just stay without any hedging, they can just stay unhedged, okay? And retain, yeah, 100% unhedged, uh, let's say 100% unhedged, and we have another option, we are just keeping it very simple. Actually, you have many other options in terms of hedging, whether you should be 100% hedged or 25% hedged, but we'll assume that it, if you want to hedge, you'll have to hedge 100%. That's the option. So, you have only two options. Either you stay 100% unhedged or you go 100% hedged, okay? These are the only two decision choices that you have and what should the airline do, okay? So then we decide, so we looked at, remember that the underlying position is an outright short position, okay? So we're once again trying to understand the difference between the short outright position and the spread positions. So because the underlying position is an outright short position and if they hedge, okay, if they hedge by, uh, so one option is to remain short. In this case, you'll have a, uh, to remain unhedged, okay? And the other option is to go long uh, jet fuel, uh, crude oil futures, okay? No. And create a hedge, long hedge position. And the net result, so that now the net position that we have um, in option two, which is the 100% hedged option, in option two, the net position that the airline has is not just long crude oil futures, but that has to be combined because now we are talking about a net position. Yeah, so hedge position plus underlying position, the net of the two. Okay, so the net position that they have, is everyone following so far? Yes, sir. Okay, so if you choose option two, that is to go 100% hedged, then you are going, uh, then you are going to create a net position which is going to be short the spread position. Okay, a short spread position in the jet fuel crude oil spread, where the spread is defined as jet fuel minus crude oil. Remember, we discussed this, we looked at this um, spreadsheet. Yeah, so if we just look at this, it will be easier to understand. So you have a short jet fuel position naturally, the underlying position, then you go long crude oil, okay? So now what you have, the net position, if you're evaluating option two, option two is to go 100% hedged. So when you go 100% hedged, uh, in either case you look at whether it's 100% unhedged or 100% hedged, in either case you will always look at the net position. In option one, which is 100% unhedged, because there is no position on the hedge book, okay, so the net position is short, outright short jet fuel in option one, okay. Now in option two, you go 100% hedge, so now you have two outright positions. You have an outright short position in jet fuel, and you have an outright long position in crude oil. Is this clear? These are both individually outright positions, but when you combine them, the net position is a spread position or a differential position, okay. You no longer have an outright position, now you have a spread position. Okay, and of course you have to, you can define the spread either way, but it's we have just defined it as jet fuel minus CL. You can also define it as CL minus jet fuel, whatever you want to do. But this is better if you do it this way. Then you see that you are actually we did this exercise earlier, so you can look at the earlier video. We saw this that you are actually now you have a what what position do you have in the spread, short or long? Short. Short. You are short the spread because if the spread value increases, you will lose money. Okay. Spread value increases essentially will mean that the jet fuel prices have gone up more than the crude oil prices, or they have fallen less than the crude oil prices. Okay, either way the spread will go up. So whenever the spread goes up, you lose money. So therefore your position now is short the spread. So these guys have gone, if they choose option two, they will go from a short outright short position in jet fuel to a short spread position, okay, in uh, the jet fuel crude oil spread, okay? And what did we discuss that which has lower volatility? Which which guy, which position has lower volatility? The spread position or the outright? Spread. Spread. spread position has low volatility, okay? Hopefully someday we can get some actual numbers, historical numbers and see. But you will always see that this, for these kinds of spread, like jet fuel minus crude oil, these kinds of spread, and you can visually see it also from that uh, picture. To understand spread position in, in the spread, but how it is possible to 
get the spread position and enter spread. I'm coming to that. We have not yet gone, gone to that in detail. First, make sure, let's make sure that everybody is able to follow this. Actually, I'm repeating a lot of stuff, but I'm so concerned about the, the quality of CP that we are getting that I'm, I feel that people are not able to follow even the stuff that we have already discussed. People have not internalized that. So actually, the entire discussion is almost a repeat of what we have already gone through in the class, okay? But we're just rehashing it. Okay, so uh, as you can see, the volatility of the spreads so or the other lesson that we want to learn for these kinds of spreads, jet fuel minus crude oil, if you do jet fuel minus price of uh, General Motors, then that may not make much sense, okay? So normally when we look at spread positions, we look at things which are related, okay? No, no, not intra-markets. Uh, this is an inter-market spread. This is an example of an inter- We are coming to that distinction later on. But first, let's understand this point. That the, the volatility of the spread position will be lower. So the risk of the spread position will be lower. Okay, that will be true for all these kinds of related spreads. Like if you look at soybean, uh, soybeans versus soybean meal. Soybean meal prices minus soybean. You know how soybeans are crushed, okay? Then after crushing, you get soybean meal and soybean oil. You take soybeans and you crush them and you get soybean meal and you get soybean oil. Okay, so there's something called a spoiled soybean crush spread, which actually tells you for each unit of soybeans, how many units of oil and how many units of meal are you getting. Okay, so uh, for these kinds of spreads, it will always be true that the volatility of the outright position is higher than the volatility of the spread position. Okay. So that's why if a, if an airline, okay, which is in the position of a hedger, if an airline is asked to choose between the two options, stay 100% unhedged or go 100% hedged, they should always go for the 100% hedged uh, position, okay, provided they have, unless they have a very strong view on the other side, because if you, uh, they should always go for, because the risk of that net position, which is short the spread, the risk of that is much less than being short jet fuel outright. Is this clear to everyone? Because classically, a hedger should be reducing risk. Why have I lost the internet? <coughs> Very strange. Okay, so we got it back. All right, so this you this now the, the the point the topic that we were discussing is basis risk. Okay, so this kind of a spread position risk. Okay, so remember that uh, even if the airline chooses option two, which is 100% hedge position, okay, they, they have still not eliminated all of their risk because the spread can move. As you can see visually from this chart, the spread does not stay constant. Can you see that? Like in 2009, uh, late 2009, the spread became very narrow as uh, compared to, let's say, uh, middle of 2008. Compared to the middle of 2008, the spread is much narrower in late 2009. So the spread also is not constant. It is moving. But it's moving much less than the outright price of either crude oil or jet fuel. Okay. That's the idea. So they still have some risk. Okay. So this risk is called basis risk. Okay. So here we say that they don't have, uh, they no longer have outright position risk, but they do have basis risk. That's kind of like another name for spread risk or spread position risk. So basis risk is like another name for spread position risk where the spread is some kind of a meaningful spread like soybean meal versus soybeans or jet fuel minus crude oil some kind of meaningful spread okay not some random spread like you know price of t notes then your t notes minus price of uh, apple stock which is no no meaningful relationship as such okay so that's not a, a meaningful spread but if you take a meaning is everyone able to follow what i mean by meaningful spread that there is some kind of economic logic in that spread that is a, there is a Many people will have exposure, would have exposure to that. 
Okay. So this is called basis risk. The topic here is basis risk. So this is what is called basis risk. Now when the airline has chosen to go 100% hedge, okay, now they have basis risk. They no longer have outright position risk. They are exposed to the basis between jet fuel and crude oil. Okay. This is what is called basis risk. This is another term that you need to know in, uh, in the context of hedging. Hedging and risk management. Okay, now let's look at another important concept that you need to be aware of. Okay, that there is a there is a trade-off. Okay, we can highlight this. Okay. Okay, you understand? Everyone knows what a trade-off is. You know what a trade-off is. Everyone knows what a trade-off is, right? Okay. Yeah, to get something. So, whole of economics, the one important idea in economics. No, no, trade off is not squaring a position. Trade off means one minute. Let me just explain. Trade off means if you want to eat, let's say, a big, uh, uh, you know, bucket of ice cream. So, you will get a lot of pleasure from eating it, but you may put on weight. So, you are trading it off. You are, you are saying that your pleasure from eating a bucket of ice cream is more than uh, you are not worried about how much weight you are going to put on. Okay, that's a trade-off. So you can't have it both ways. You can't say I'm going to eat the bucket of ice cream and derive all the pleasure at the same time I don't want to put on weight. So you can't have both. There is a trade-off. That's what is meant by trade-off. Is this clear? Trade-off means you give up something, you get something, but you have to give up something in return. Okay. So this is one of the central ideas behind all economic analysis. Okay. One is that the scarcity of resources. Scarcity of resources is one idea in economics, and the other idea is that you have trade-offs in everything. You can't have both. You have to choose which you want, which one you, which is more preferable to you, and then you take that and you do give up the other. One, okay. So now, if you look at this concept of a question, a question could have arisen: Why did the airline not hedge directly in jet fuel? Why did they not? They have a short position. They have an outright short position in jet fuel. Why did they not directly hedge in the jet fuel? Remember, they went into a different market. Okay, they went into the jet crude oil market, which is actually a different market. Because why is how will you identify? How will you justify this? How will you say that? How will you prove that? Uh, or how will you justify saying that the crude oil market is a different market from the jet fuel market? How will you justify in technical terms? What did we say? What is the market? If you go back to how we defined the market, how we did? How did we define the market? Whenever any of this changes the market. Yeah, a venue where, yeah, so you have gone already far ahead through the next step. You have to start with the first step. So we said the market is a market is a place where you exchange assets. And what are those two assets called? Base asset and long asset. Okay. So the rule that Sayur has already gone ahead to is that whenever any of the, so the rule that we had is how do you identify a unique market? And how do you say that this market over here is different from that market over there? Because if the rule is that if any of the assets changes, it's a different market. So gold priced in yen terms is different is a different market from gold priced in US dollar terms. Okay. So here, what is happening? So how would you answer this? How would you justify the statement that the jet fuel market is a different market from the crude oil market? Because what is different? The base asset is different. Okay. Because here the base asset is jet fuel. Here the base asset is crude oil. They're totally different, uh, very different, product. not totally different, but very different commodities. Okay. So that's why these are different markets. Okay. So the question that you could have asked is, why did this airline not hedge directly in the jet fuel market? Why did they bother to hedge in the? Why did they go and hedge in the crude oil market? Okay. So here now we have to bring up the idea of liquidity. Okay. So let's bring up the try to understand this concept here. Okay. So let's see this one. What I've written here. So when an airline, this kind of a situation, if you look at this airline situation, the airline is actually see what would happen now. Look at the option of if the airline had a choice and they could have hedged directly in the jet fuel market. Now we have two choices. Earlier we looked at one choice, which is whether I should be 100% unhedged or whether I should be 100% hedged. Okay. So there we know that if unless an airline has a strong view on the direction of crude oil prices or, or jet fuel prices, the overall direction, unless they have a strong view, they should always go 100% hedged. 
Okay, if that's if there's no other choice, either zero percent or hundred percent. Okay, there's no intermediate choice. They should always go because that reduces their total risk. Okay, and that's what a hedger should be doing. Okay, so that's uh, the first one decision. The other decision that they have is, if you take the if on the first decision choice, which is to be hundred percent hedged or to be hundred percent unhedged. Okay, you choose the second decision, which is that option two, which is you go hundred percent hedged. Okay. Now, in that decision of going 100%, when you've taken the decision to go 100% hedge, you have another decision to make. Should I hedge in the jet fuel market itself, where my outright short position is, my underlying position is, or should I hedge in the crude oil futures market? You have another decision to make. Okay, here again, so you see how everything is, where we discuss decision problems, Everything is connected to decision problems. So if you see, well, the way I'm teaching you finance is very different from what you find in a textbook, a typical finance textbook, because whatever I'm teaching you is completely focused on decision problems. Decision problems that you'll actually face in the real world, and how do you go about solving, what theoretical background do you need to solve those decision problems, okay? So that's why everything here is focused on decision problems. Okay, so you have a second decision problem now. Having decided to go 100% hedge, you have another decision to make. Should I do my 100% hedge in the jet fuel market or should I do it in the crude oil futures market? Is everyone clear about this problem? Okay, this is a problem because you have to take a decision. Okay, so here there you have this other, this is again you are facing a trade-off. Okay, here you are facing a trade-off. If you do it in the jet fuel market, if you do the hedge in the jet fuel market, okay, what will be your net position? Zero. Net position will be zero because you have a long position and you have a short underlying position and you create a long underlying position and both the positions are the same market so the net position in that market in the jet fuel market goes to zero is this clear to everyone yes if you choose the first option okay everyone it will go to zero okay second and then what will happen in the second option that you have is to hedge in the crude oil position in the crude oil market okay so in the first option obviously if your net position is zero what is your risk zero risk is also zero so you have completely eliminated your risk, okay? And in the other, if you choose the other option, if you, if you choose to hedge through crude oil futures, okay? Then what happens to your net position? Does it go to zero? Spread position. You end up with a spread position, okay? Which has lower volatility than a outright position, but it still has some risk. Yes. That is what we call basis risk. So you do have basis risk, which is not zero. There is some basis risk, okay? So therefore, you would have been, uh, I mean, without going into further details or further discussions or without considering any other factor it looks like it would be much better to hedge it get in the jet fuel market directly okay because then you have a clean hedge and you have no uh, residual no basis risk no no spread position risk but we don't have profits also in that market sorry we don't have profits and we both yeah, but the objective of hedging, what is the objective of hedging? Is it to earn profits? Not to earn profits, but you said that hedges can also make profits. And no, no, that that we that is part of the discussion in the project, etc. That is also a further discussion. But at this stage, we are discussing a kind of pure choice, okay, to bring out certain concepts, okay. So, uh, so where were we actually? Okay, so if you hedge, if you hedge in the jet fuel market, if the hedge, if the hedge position is also in the same market where the underlying position is and you go 100% hedged that's why we are discussing these artificial choices so between 100% hedged and 100% unhedged in the real world your choices are much many many more actually because you don't have to go 100% hedged you can go 25% then go to 50% then come back to 40% that's how you would make a lot of money okay in the real. but here we are trying to uh, create an artificial distinction uh, artificial situation to bring out the concepts okay all right so what we are trying to say is that if so, it seems like it seems like therefore that uh, it would be much better to always hedge in the jet fuel market because then your underlying exposure, underlying position, and your hedge position they are in the same market and they offset each other. So you are left with zero position and zero risk. But if you were in the oil market, okay, you would be still left with some basis risk. With some spread position risk, which is not zero. Okay, so why have that position? So you could say that it's always better to go for a hedge in the same market. Okay, the reason that people don't do that is a question with respect to this is what we are talking about. Okay, so what we are doing is there actually there's an trade off involved because the jet fuel market is not that liquid, it doesn't have such high levels of price transparency as you have in the case of 
crude oil futures. Okay, crude oil futures that basically derives from the liquidity of the market. Transparency, etc., really comes from the liquidity of the market. So, uh, so the crude oil market is crude oil futures market is very liquid. Okay, when people want to first express a view on the crude oil price, they first go and hit the futures market because that is the most liquid. If you want to deal in physical cargoes of oil, you have to call up some uh, oil trader. You have to arrange the cargoes. Okay, the ship may not be available. This, that, it's a big headache. If you want to really do some something very quickly in the crude oil market, the first thing you do is you hit the futures market because it's very liquid. It trades almost round the clock. Okay, so that's why the futures markets have very high liquidity, and then the price transparency is also quite high. So what happens is they the reason that uh, many airlines would hedge. Uh, through the crude oil market is essentially they are right. accepting a trade-off. They are saying that I will. What are we saying? This trade-off is we are talking about. See, if you uh, the two terms that I've used. Okay, this trade-off that we have just discussed. There are two terms that you have to be aware of, which is The trade-off is between the trade-off that we are discussing now. The trade-off is between the accuracy of the hedge and the transactional efficiency of the hedge. Okay, where uh, so these are the two terms that we are. These are this is where the trade-off is between. It's either between. So it's essentially the trade-off is like this. If you want a more accurate hedge, only in this context, in the airline, jet fuel, crude oil context that we are discussing. We are using this context to bring out this idea. Okay, this made it. This problem may exist in many other contexts. Okay, but we are using this particular context to bring out the difference. So the trade-off. Now everybody knows what a trade-off is. If you want something, you have to give up something else. You can't have both. Okay, sacrifice. Yeah. Okay. So here the trade-off is between the accuracy of the hedge and the transactional efficiency of the hedge. Okay. So if they choose option uh, one, which is To a hedge in the jet fuel market, is that a, is that going to be an accurate hedge? Yes. Is that more accurate than the crude oil hedge? Yes. Because it totally eliminates the risk, so it is an accurate hedge. Okay. So, but because I've already given you information that jet fuel prices are much less, the jet fuel market is much less liquid. Price transparency is not that high. If you want to trade in large volumes. It's very difficult to find counterparties. Uh, you may move the price dramatically. That's what liquidity means. The liquidity means that you saw what was happening when we looked at the order book in the euro. Even during Asia, even when London was not open, you see how many amounts, what amounts were being offered: 12 million, 19 million, 20 million, and it's changing continuously. And the prices are so tight, fifth decimal, half or fifth decimal uh, kind of spreads. So that's what me, that's what a liquid market gives you. Okay, very low transaction costs. Very low transaction costs, very liquid. You can move. It means that you can move a large amount of volume without much without much effect on the price. That's what liquidity means. Yeah. Here we are taking the example of an airline company with respect to jet fuel. Yeah. But jet fuel is required daily. If we want some other company who requires fuel for uh, let's say three months in a year, so what is the best way that they will control the prices? Okay. Yes, we'll come to that. Let's first make sure that we understand this airline situation because we want to make sure that people understand the concepts that we are discussing now. Okay. So just stick to the jet fuel airline situation. So is it is this clear to everyone that if you have uh, if you have uh, if you hedge in the jet fuel market, the accuracy of the hedge is much better than much much higher accuracy than if you hedge in crude oil futures. Okay. So, because you eliminate your risk, but because we said that the jet fuel price market is not that liquid, okay? Time up. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. So, anyway, I'll just briefly. So, you can wrap up this uh, on your own. I'm just going to quickly just finish in one or two sentences. So, here you're facing a trade-off. But the reason, so then, why do people hedge? Many airlines hedge in the crude oil futures market because it's a, they are willing to trade off the accuracy. They say that we don't want so much accuracy. I am much more interested in transactional efficiency because the crude oil futures market is much more liquid. They can take, they can hedge, unhedge several times if they want to. If they want to unwind the hedge for some reason, it's much easier to do it. It will cost them much less. Transaction costs are much less. So transactional efficiency of hedging in the crude oil futures market is much higher. Although accuracy is much lower. So they are trading off the accuracy and choosing the. I mean, they, 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 this is how they are making the trade off. 
Is this clear to everyone? Okay, so I'll let you go now. If you have questions, you can ask me now. The rest of you can go. Okay. Please make sure you revise concepts because CP performance is very poor. And please start practicing on your Rwanda account for your uh, project. Is everyone clear about what has to be done? Everything, read the videos. What is the problem? Practice is to be one minute, guys. Practice in Rwanda is to be done only in the primary account. When you are practicing, one minute. Please look at this top here, primary. Make sure that your account is, account currently is primary. Practice has to be done in the primary account. No practicing in the trading project trading account. Create the project trading account and leave it aside. For when you start the project. Please make sure you start practicing. Everyone should know what has to be done. This project is more complicated. Is it more complicated than the first one? Yes or no? More complicated. So many things to watch out for. So please start practicing. Better to make it now in case you have any problems with it. Okay. You see now she is the spreadsheet. Yeah. Because you are sitting next to Jen, then no, no, don't sit next to Jen. We were not there. Some voice was there. I was just moving my head and I was seeing the head. Jen was talking to you. So, but Jen, we were not talking. Sir, pass in the room. Sir, chat was with you. No, no, one minute. Sir, they were even here. Those are one minute. Sir, they were not talking. See, if you don't want, if you don't want to be penalized, one minute. One minute. One minute. If you, don't, if you don't want to be penalized, don't look at your side, left side, right side, look straight at the chart. Look straight at the chart. Either you look at the chart or you do what Kama and all, they are always looking at me. Sir, I was looking at you. That is bad luck. Collateral damage. Sir, what do you have? Sir, stop. This is a push. I have Jain. I saw Jain looking at you and talking.